Welcome to Petability. I'm your host, Kathy Simons. And I'm your host, Chris Cranston. Our podcast provides interviews and information to help your pets live their best lives. Morning, Kathy. Good morning, Chris. How are you? I'm very, very well. Um, Hey, I do have a a little story to share today because I'm I'm pretty pumped about it. Yes, do tell. I can tell you're excited. I can feel it. Yeah, 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 I'm amped. So our listeners may know that I'm involved with a a rescue and I primarily foster cats in need and kittens, which are adorable. Well, I got a uh, request from one of the leaders in our organization and she said, hey, can you go get this cat that's being surrendered by their owner unfortunately the owner's elderly very ill and just gotten out of the hospital and she can't handle the cat the cat i I think missed her but is displaying her affection in inappropriate ways so was you know kind of tripping the owner up and and biting and scratching at her ankles and you know real safety issue right Well, I was told that the owner was going to have the cat in a carrier, and I just needed to drive over, pick the cat up, and take it to the vet. It's never that easy. It's never that easy. Yeah. (laughs) So I arrive, and the owner, who is this tiny, tiny little woman, loved her, uh, and her very large uh, son-in-law had been Mm -hmm. chasing this cat around for, I think, at least an hour, trying to get it in the carrier. Oh, and that makes it so much worse because now you're, you're chasing the cat. That's freaking the cat out. Oh, it's just making it so much yeah. worse. Oh. But I was shocked because when I arrived, Mary, that's the cat's name, named mm-hmm. after the owner's mother, was perched on top of the curio cabinet. So I'm like, hmm, challenging, but maybe we can make this work. So I have a plan. No, no, Mary is not in the carrier. She has gone now behind the curio cabinet. None of us knew how she got back there. Like she must have just slid down this little triangle of space. <laughs> She became we liquid. Yeah, she became liquid, Chris, and just yeah. like slid down in there. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I could I could kind of peek and I could see her back there. And and so go to plan B and um, we're going to, you know, slightly turn the curio cabinet out with all its valuables. And I left that to to the son in law. And when we turned it, there she goes again, turned into liquid and sneaked mm-hmm. out the opposite side in a space that I swear was no bigger than two inches. Right. So we have to abort mission. I let the rescue know, and um, we put out a call for a helper. And fortunately, uh, my friend Emily steps up to the plate, and we go over there. We wanted to let the the cat decompress, and so we went over there a couple days later. And again, had a had a plan. And so this time, we just the owner goes in by herself. We could hear Mary eagerly greet her, and we said, "Just walk in." And pretend like you have to go to the bathroom and then keep her in the bathroom. And so we're hiding around the corner. And uh, next thing we know, here comes Patty. And she's like, she's in the bathroom. Okay, great. So we go in there and I'm thinking like, Emily's got this, right? She volunteered. And so we're trying to make friends and we're, you know, doing the slow bit blank per Jackson galaxy. And, and we're trying to feed her some really good stuff. And, and Mary is, is up on a, one of those little stools that, that people use in their showers. And, and anyway, this is taking a really long time. And, and Emily puts on the gloves and then suddenly she turns to me and she's like, I'm scared. I can't do it. Oh no. <laughs> Oh, no, poor Emily. It's so scary. It is scary. Well, anybody who has dealt with a fractious cat knows. Yes, it's terrifying. And so she's like, are you scared? And I'm like, no. So I put on the the gloves. We open the carrier. I reach over. I grab Mary, who instead of like thrashing and, you know, limbs that extend like three feet in every direction, Mary curled into a ball. I plunked her into the carrier and off we went. And off you went. Good job, Mary. You did it. <laughs> hey, what about good job, Chris? Oh, I mean, good job, Chris. Yes, good job, Thank Chris. You. And good Thank job, you. Emily. <laughs> that, that was my first, my first, uh, yeah, quote, rescue. And so it, that was, I, I was pumped. I was jazzed. That's smooth, very smooth. And mm. good for Mary, too, because, you know, that, that second, it was, it was good that you guys had decided um, on that first visit, this was just was too much for Mary right now. And we'll come back and revisit that. And, yeah. and I think that that was helpful also. It gave Mary some time to decompress. You got her into the bathroom, perfect scenario. Um, and then she got in the carrier. So 
I hope Mary gets um, a great home. You mm-hmm. know, it sounds like she, she just needs some time to decompress and maybe we can find a good match for her. So good job, Chris. Thank you. Yeah, she went to the vet um, immediately and got her health certificate. She's in great health. She's only two years old. And yeah, so she is in our adoption center. So yeah, success story. Great, great. Well, let's move on, shall we? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. We should move on because we have <laughs> such, we have so much great stuff today to talk about with our guest. Absolutely. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm really pumped about this. You know, I'm um, going to be talking a little bit about the sport of agility. And I know that people are going to laugh at this and it's kind of silly, but I had a pug that did agility. And when you hear more about it, you'll find that, you know, a lot of dogs can do agility. I think people don't think that pugs can do stuff like this, but they can, they can. So I'm pumped. Oh, yeah. And, and that's, really what I want the emphasis of, of this show to be. You know, I have many people who say, I'm not athletic enough to do agility. And mm-hmm. you don't have to be. It, you know, and, and that's what our, our speaker, our guest is going to talk to us about. Nor do they think with certain breeds that yeah. their pet can do agility. Yeah. Their dog can do agility, like you yeah. said, with yeah. a pug. I have yes. Cavaliers, you know, it's not, we typically think of like, you know, border collies and these right. uh, working, working class dogs. So, so without further ado, I would like to welcome my friend and agility instructor, Nolan Ring. Nolan, like many of us, got her love for dogs from her mother growing up as they had Dachshunds, Boston Terriers, Rhodesian Ridgebacks, and Irish Setters. And the only dog sport that they were aware of at the time was obedience. So she did a bit of that with the Ridgebacks and a setter. Well, fast forward to the mid to late 90s, where she attended Camp Gone to the Dogs in Vermont with a German Shepherd and Golden Retriever. And it was there that she was introduced to agility. And this was a time when clean run, which is now synonymous with the sport of agility and has become huge was merely a two-page mimeographed newsletter so how far we have come and certainly have a plethora of sports to choose from at this time well while nolan thought that agility was quote a hoot at the time she didn't become more involved until around 2000 when they got a rescue german shepherd named nina who was shy and lacked some confidence so uh someone suggested that she try agility with nina and the rest, as they say, is history. Since then, Nolan has trained and competed with in agility with two Australian Shepherds and a Border Collie, and they currently have a young Border Collie puppy named Poppet, who is described as a total kick. I have yet to meet her, can't wait, but uh, they're having tons of fun with her. And about five years ago, uh, Nolan started teaching agility, mostly in the form of classes and workshops and loves it. And Nolan really enjoys working with, with all people and, and dogs that, and not even those that are necessarily interested in competition. And that's certainly me. And I'd always been a little bit nervous about getting out there on the floor. Um, but Nolan really changed that for me and has emphasized making agility fun. And so that's, that's where she really shines and helps people to deepen their relationships with their dogs, um, by, by helping them to understand their, their own dog's behavior. But I must say that agility has also really helped me to understand other dogs behavior. It's really helped me in my practice as a rehabber. Um, I feel I can read dogs better. I can handle dogs better and generally communicate with them better, which is really important. So anyway, agility, as emphasized by Nolan, is always about teamwork and being a good partner to your dog. And in order to be a good partner, you need to understand what motivates him or her, and most importantly, how to make it fun. So Nolan finds it very rewarding as an instructor to see that light bulb come on for people when they and their dog as a team do things that they never, ever thought they could do. So Welcome, Nolan. Welcome, Nolan. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for the intro, Chris. That was lovely. <laughs> You're very welcome. <laughs> I get a little tongue-tied sometimes, but uh, I, think, <laughs> I think I get the message across. So, yeah. right. This is uh, such an exciting topic, Nolan, for 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 me and for Chris, because, like Chris said, um, 
this is really, I mean, if, I mean, it is a sport and there is a competition, but for, for what Chris said, uh, it's about teamwork and building this relationship with your dog. And, and I had a pug that I did agility with when we first you know, got him and this was my first dog. And so this really just opened up a whole new world for us about being uh, a teamwork and, and the, and the amazing ability for me to then not only read my dog, but to read my dog reading me with subtle movements mm-hmm. and subtle hand gestures and shoulder mm-hmm. movement and, and, and mm-hmm. kind of bringing myself into his world a little bit about what, you know, what he was seeing. Um, but for people who, who don't um, know what agility is, Nolan, can you just start off with talking about what is the sport of agility? What does it, sure. what does it entail? Sure. Um, Agility is essentially running an obstacle course with your dog. You are the navigator um, and you are, so you are the one who's directing your dog over, under, through the obstacles. And if you just describe the sport itself, that's essentially what it is. You do it um, as fast as you can, as accurately as you can, but there's a whole lot more to agility, as you said, than that. Um, that's sort of what people see, but what they don't see is all of the teamwork and the training and the, um, and the relationship that goes into making those things happen. Um, and that's the, as you said, that's the fun stuff as far as I'm concerned. Oh yeah, that is the fun stuff just to see, oh boy, my dog opening up and us becoming a Mm -hmm. team. Um, mm-hmm. was, and, and then it kind of translated into other things, you know, what, because yeah. we were a team, uh, things went better for us as far as our training would go and things right. went better for us as far as like even vet visits went because we, right. you know, we were a team. Um, can you, or what we'd like to call now, cause I have Mac, my new dog, Mac is, we call him team, we call us team Mac or team Mac. I'm on mm-hmm. team. <laughs> so, but can you, can you tell me when did, when did agility start as an organized sport? Is mm-hmm. it a new sport? It's, it's not new anymore. Um, it, it started as sort of halftime entertainment in Britain um, during the Crufts dog show in like mid, the mid 70s. So, you know, Crufts over there is a huge dog show and they were doing some sort of probably setting up rings or something like that. And they wanted to keep the audience entertained. And so um, that, that was the very first time that agility had been done in public. Um, and from there, uh, the UK was ahead of us. They started with competition in probably the early to mid 80s, which is around when the sport came to this country. And it's changed dramatically since then. At that time, um, it was it was completely people with their pets doing agility, which was uh, which so it meant that people weren't going out and getting these really fast border collies or shelties or whatever specifically to do agility. It was people who were do, doing agility with their pets. The equipment was very different. It was these heavy. It was made out of wood. It was heavy boards. The jumps were huge. The largest dogs jumped thirty inches, which is a huge jump. Wow. Yeah. Um, and and so from the time that that the early, probably the early to mid nineties is when the sport really took off in this country or started to take off in this country. And there were various organizations. The first um, agility organization in this country was, was called USDAA, which is United States Dog Agility Association. Um, since then, many have cropped up, each of which has different sort of different flavors. You know, there are some that are intensely competitive um, others that are a little more relaxed and a little more comfortable for people who are who are playing with their pets and aren't you know don't have all the equipment in their backyard. Um, but it's become a huge industry, and I think that provides lots and lots and lots of opportunities for people who want to do it at any level. Right, right. And and Nolan, is there a certification process? Did you have to become? Did you have to? Uh, go to school? What 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 was the process of becoming a, an instructor? There is not anything like that. Mm-hmm. Um, basically what happens, so anybody can, can sort of claim to be an instructor, and there are um, a lot of good instructors out there. Mm-hmm. Basically, I think what um, what you need is an understand to be a good instructor, in my opinion, is to have an understanding both of the sport and the mechanics of the sport, but also of people and their relationships with their dogs and how to help enhance and enrich that. And, and in a lot of ways, I, I think that that's, that is the foundation of agility. 
um, if, if you don't have that sort of connection um, and your dog it doesn't doesn't want to play with you. You can't really do agility, so that's mm-hmm. where a lot of it starts. When when I'm teaching, and like Chris said, I there are wonderful instructors out there who who can teach you about the mechanics and how to get from point A to point B faster. Um, but what I really enjoy doing is working with the people who who may never compete. I don't care whether mm-hmm. whether my students compete, but helping them really understand that the foundation of this sport um, is is your relationship with your dog. So that's where it all starts. So Nolan, you mentioned the equipment and so forth. Um, Can you describe, you know, what the equipment entails today and what a typical training session might look like? You know, are, are, the the person and and their dog working on a, you know, specific skill, um, you know, is it broken down? Do you just get out there and run courses? I I know when I go back to Iowa and I mentioned that my dogs do agility, many people are like, agility, what's that? And Mm -hmm. as you said, the, the, I think most succinct way of describing it is it's an obstacle course that I take my dogs through. So yeah, just, just describe that in a little more detail if you would. Sure. The, the equipment itself differs slightly from organization to organization, but, but there are huge similarities. So for example, there are tunnels of various lengths. Um, There can be 15 foot, 10 foot, 20 foot tunnels. There's something called an A-frame, which is the shape of, uh, of, of, um, goes up, comes down, same length on both sides, um, and can be adjusted for height according to, you know, the dog's abilities um, and and maybe age. Um, there are jumps, just regular jumps, different kinds of jumps. There may be ones with a single bar. There may be ones that are called either a double or a triple that are that are um, three bars set at a certain distance. So it's a it's a bigger jump. It's a spread jump. Um, there's a tire that um that's suspended um in the air that at at the correct height jump height for your dog that the dogs go through um there's something called a dog walk which is 36 feet long it's four feet high there's a 12 foot up ramp a 12 foot across and a 12 foot down ramp um there's something called a seesaw which is essentially a seesaw your dog goes i think it's 12 feet long your dog runs up it and then rides it down. Um, those are, those are the, I, I believe those are mostly the common pieces of e- equipment. Um, and a train, as far as a training session goes, um, that's sort of an interesting question because it differs, um, it differs depending on the skills of the dog, the skills of the handler, whether it's a class, whether it's a workshop, so for, or whether it's a private lesson. So, for me, if I'm if I'm helping somebody with skills or obstacle performance, which means, okay, how are we going to get this dog to um, perform the A-frame up and over it and and with the appropriate what we call end behavior at the at the at the after the dog has gone up and over the A-frame, there's a there's a an area coming down that's a different color from the rest of it that the dog's feet must go through that area. It's a safety issue. Um, mm-hmm. You don't want a dog jumping from, from the top of an A-frame. So they have to come down and they have to come through. You can have multiple different behaviors at the bottom there. You can have what they call two on, two off, where the dog's hind legs are on the on the obstacle, the front legs are off the obstacle, and they wait there until you release them. You can have the dog run through it. Um, and that's a trained behavior. But so it depends on on exactly what the point of the lesson or, or the classes. Um, so we can work on how do you teach your dog to do the end behavior that you desire on the, um, on the A-frame. That's an obstacle performance kind of skill. Then there are lots of handling kinds of skills. Like how do you, um, how do you execute a cross or a side change? The dog starts a jump on your left hand and then ends up on your right hand what are what are the possible um, options for doing that and how do you do it most efficiently and how do you communicate to your dog that you're doing that so so I for me I come in with a plan if it's a private lesson I will ask people what do you want to work on I mean it's not helpful to them if I come in dictating 
what I think they should work on. Um, there are lots of different things, you know, so I will ask people, what do you want to work on? And then I'll, I'll make a plan around that. If it's a class, I come in with, um, with a skill. For example, I'm teaching these days, I'm teaching a skills and drills uh, class. And I come in with something that I want to work on. And what I do is make sure that that the the skill that I'm working on can be done at several different levels, because in any given class, you'll have teams that are pretty much ranked beginners, and they are more than welcome. And some people who may be a little bit more advanced and have have a few more skills. So I try to set up a skill that that um, will work for everybody that that people can, um, who are just starting out, we can just work on the beginning piece of it, and they can be successful at that. And then if the beginning piece is a little bit too, um, too easy for some people, then then I'll, um, then I sort of amp it up a little bit. So that's with a class and with a workshop. um, What I do is I have a topic. And I will, um, and I will come up with exercises and maybe sequences that will reinforce that explain um, a particular skill, typically a handling skill, not an obstacle performance skill, like I was saying with the dog walk or a seesaw or something like that. Typically, it's a handling skill, um, and and I'll I'll present that in a variety of ways so people understand um, that this is that when you say something like a front cross. All that really means is that you're in front of your dog when you execute it. You can execute a front cross in a whole variety of ways, depending on where you're going next. So I try to present um, a variety of options for how you would execute a particular handling maneuver. And then at the end, we put it together into a sequence. And again, this is my goal is for every level of handler to be comfortable and to feel successful. Um, and, and so we will work on, we'll work on specific skills, but then we'll also work on if, the, if an issue arises where a dog is distracted, we break off and we work on that hmm. because you can't do agility. As we said, it goes back to the relationship. If your dog's really distracted, we need to sort of, um, understand that, deconstruct that. What's going on? Is there a way that we can help you and your dog be engaged? That's more important than any specific skill. Mm. So that's sort of the breakdown with how I do things. I love the the whole piece about the relationship. It's so important. Mm-hmm. You're right. If your dog is distracted or something is not or for over threshold, um, we right. need to be able to identify that so that we can exactly. work on that piece before we can move forward as a team. And as right. you're talking about this, and I'm sure Chris is doing the same thing when you're talking about the pieces of equipment and what they do and what they have to do to get up and get over is I think about mobility and how connected Mm -hmm. a dog has to be to their body to be able to perform these specific sorts of feats. So if you think about the dog walk, how Mm -hmm. much you have to have, you have to have proprioception to get over the dog walk. You have Mm -hmm. to have hind end strength to get up over that Um, Mm A-frame. You have to have, you know, good shoulder muscles and good flexibility of the spine to go through the weave poles. So it kind of relates to the therapy and how Crystal sometimes will use, and I will use some of these uh, pieces of equipment in therapy to rehab these dogs Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. it's fun for them it's fun Mm -hmm. for them the dogs feel great Mm -hmm. when they've accomplished something right Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well i think that that goes back to relationship too because and this is where i think that the that it's both on and sort of off the um off an agility course part of why they love it is because typically we're excited when they do it right you know that we come in you know, this is why I, I will never force an animal to do something that they're truly afraid of, because then there's no pleasure in it. No. You know, what, what, what we try to do and what it, it's, a, it's a difficult thing for a lot of people. I tend to be very effusive, as I'm sure Chris could, could attest to. Um, I get excited when people are successful. I get really excited when dogs are successful. And it matters to them. And this is one of the things I try to impress upon students is that your demeanor and your engagement matters. We can't ask a dog to be engaged with us if we're not truly engaged with them. And you can see them. It's so wonderful right. when, when right. people engage their dog and the dog is like beside themselves. They're wagging no. their, you know. I have to tell you this little story. But, you know, we talked about my dog, um, my first dog, Buddha, who, who did agility. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and we, we did it for fun. You know, we, we weren't going to compete, but I will tell you that our club did a demo at, um, you know, one of these, you know, I don't know, one of these conventions, we did a demo. And I, I remember was a, that it was, I it was right, a pet, pet expo. Right. It was a big deal. There were was hundreds a, of people there. Big mm. deal. So, and normally I would get, you know, with my dog and I'd be relaxed and we'd have a lot of fun and so forth, but I was a little bit tense and I think he could feel mm -hmm. that. And, um, the, the, he started off beautifully. Oh God, he hit his marks. He hit his contacts. Mm -hmm. He was doing great. Unfortunately, the the ring was set up next to the popcorn stand. <laughs> <laughs> so um, when he got to the end, he slid under the curtain like a baseball player sliding into home, right? And I just cracked up and I just felt like, oh my God, that's my dog. He slid underneath and ran over to yeah. the popcorn concession stand and was standing there in line with the people. And everybody yeah. cracked up. And, and I thought to myself, you know what? Okay. My dog didn't complete the course, but you know what? It, it was fun. Yeah. And, and when people yeah. laughed and showed him and were yeah. like, you're so great. And he, he was just so proud of himself. Yes. It was, yeah. And it was really more about yeah. the fun. If I had just gone in and gone, you know what, this is just fun. Um, right. And not been, you know, tense, I think, but he had a good time right under the right. curtain popcorn stand. <laughs> right. And, and I think that that's the element of this, that I really try hard to communicate with people. Oftentimes when people compete, the only question they'll ask is, other people will ask is, did you get a cue? And my feeling about agility is yes, it's a competition. And yes, obviously it's lovely. And a cue means, what a cue means is that you got through the course, quote unquote, successfully. Right. Um, but you know, success, you define success in a lot of different ways, right? Mm -hmm. And for mm -hmm. me, Success is, were we, were we together? Were we in sync? Did my dog enjoy himself? Um, are we coming off this together and happy? And I feel like the rest of it kind of falls in place if that's the case. It, it really kind of breaks my heart if something goes poorly and you can see that the handler is frustrated, frustrated with him or herself, frustrated with the dog, and the dog leaves looking dejected. It's sad. Yeah. Um, to me, that's against sort of the essence of the sport. Right, right. Yeah, we may not have finished, but we did get popcorn and that was happy. Yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. But we you did know? get popcorn. And, yeah. Right, and people laughed and your dog was proud of himself and, really and that's awesome. And it was fun. So, yes. Nolan, can we talk a little bit about agility and whether, and, you know, we were talking about how agility is open to, you know, all dogs or any dogs, but is it, mm -hmm. is that true? I mean, I know I, my pug did it, but we also had to be careful because he's brachiocephalic. So we couldn't right. do it, you know, when it was really hot and right. um, had to be very careful about his breathing. But is it really open to, to all dogs, dogs with special needs, senior dogs, puppies? It is open. Um, yes, but, but let, me, let me give you some caveats. Um, every organization has a minimum age requirement, for example. Um, so that so now I'm talking with you about competition. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is if, if you want to compete with your dog, um, in terms of training and playing and having fun and classes, yes, it's open to any dog. Absolutely. What you would need to be able to do is have a dialogue with the instructor of the class about maybe your dog's physical limitations. Um, so maybe where, you know, the height of your dog would dictate that it would jump 14 inches. Maybe if your dog is um, a little less mobile, maybe you put the bars on the ground. Who cares? Right. Mm -hmm. Or maybe, you know, like you say, a dog with, with, you know, a, a pug or a Boston Terrier or a bulldog, something like that. You are extremely conscious of that dog's breathing. You may lower, you may lower the A-frame, you know, A-frames, there are competition heights, but they go lower than that. Um, so yes, absolutely. I know, I know of one person who actually competed beautifully with a, with a deaf dog. Um, and that man talk about relationship there and being in sync and, and very much having to connect with that dog in ways that, that we, most of us aren't used to most of us when worse comes to worse, we just scream. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so Yes. And, and certainly um, dogs who, who have mobility issues, you can, you can make adjustments. Um, there is no reason. I, I tend to tell people that, you know, when I put out a course and there are numbers on the course, they really are kind of a suggestion. Um, 
you know, if we can get through the course and, and I can help sort of help you understand different ways to maneuver through the course, that's fine. But if, you know, if you go from number one to number seven, nothing bad happens, right? Um, right. You can, you know, we can keep going and then we can come back to maybe why you got one to seven instead of one to two. But, but in terms of connecting with your dog, having fun with your dog, pretty much any dog um, can do it. I also am terribly aware of dogs that are not, maybe not physically fit. And so we want to be cautious about, about those dogs, joints, uh, body. We don't want to ask too much um, of them. Like you were saying earlier, you know, dogs that are coming back, for example, from some sort of um, any sort of an injury, you want to be particularly cautious um, and and pick and choose what they do. But of course, yes, it's available to those dogs as well. But I've also seen, um, you know, people get very frustrated, um, angry, and Nolan take them aside because you could see how that, you know, they're like, no, I'm not, I'm stopping, you know, this is it, and and you know, and and talk about it and, you know, figure out again what the, the root of that is, because that's not good for anybody, you know, and you can see as an observer how that dog is reacting to that, that negative energy. And just in, in conclusion here with my little diatribe, I also, you know, I'm going through the, the course and I'm trying to, you know, do the skills and whatever. And my dogs are rarely in front of me. So I can't really see, you know, maybe what's happening and I'm, you know, looking at the jump and, you know, what have you. And I remember Nolan pointing out that when I would hoot and holler as I was running, the excitement and energy level of my Cavaliers increased exponentially such that, again, as an observer, she could see that. And I had been criticized in the past for being so loud and and it was by just a friend who's like geez you know tone it down you're so, you know out there dial it back chris exactly <laughs> but that's my personality and right. that's what i do at home i mean i get up in the morning i'm like hey good morning you know and and so they're used to that and and i that was an aha moment for me too because what works for you know one person one dog handler relationship certainly doesn't carry over to everyone and other participants should not be judging what mm -hmm. you know that another does with their dog um, or what works what works for your team yeah exactly mm -hmm. exactly that's a really i think very important concept there there are a bunch of them there but one of them is you know, one of the ways I always start my workshops is be kind to yourself, be kind to your dog, be kind to each other. And um, because the, the whole thing about, about what's working for your team is critical and it's between you and your partner, your teammate. If I were to hoot and holler to the dog I have now, he would jettison into outer space. <laughs> However, I spent years hooting and hollering for a couple of Australian shepherds that I trained. And if I hadn't, we would have had no connection out there. So I think it's really key that people, and this is foundation training. This is what, when people get puppies, what, what I encourage most of all, actually, is figure out what's going to work for you and your team. And it's going to be different for everybody. But you want is that level of engagement. You want the dog to know that you're giving back as much as they're giving you. And it's hard work. I mean, this is the other thing. Mm -hmm. Some people who have dogs that maybe are, are, are not quite as motivated come off and, and they're panting. It's, you know, the dog may not be panting, but they've been working hard to get that dog motivated. And that's their job. I mean, you, you know, you get in the car, you bring the dog in, you're the one that says we're going to have fun at this. It's really up to you to make sure that, that you make good on that. Um, and so that, that the cohesiveness of the team really depends, I think, on the handler's willingness to sort of engage the dog in the way that the dog finds um, rewarding.
how do you communicate your pleasure with your dog, to your dog? You reward them, right? And that takes a variety of forms. And if what's rewarding to your dog is getting treats, why are you being so stingy about it? And I'm, I'm constantly, it's a, it's a hard thing for people to break. They think, they seem to think anyway, like, I gave you a treat five minutes ago. What's your problem? And I'm out there like reinforce, um, you know, depending on if you're training a behavior or if it's a behavior, behavior the dog knows well already, if you're training a behavior, you know, 50, 60 treats a minute, get them in there. Let the dog know that you are happy with them along with the happy talk. Um, so again, I, I guess the thing I keep coming back to, and it's been fun for me to think about this stuff over, over time, is, is engagement. That you don't just hand a dog a cookie and say, you know, we're even now. Mm -hmm. um, it's basically, you know, you, when you are giving a dog a cookie or playing with a toy or talking to them, whatever it is, you should be really looking at that dog and engaging that dog and seeing if that dog is receiving it in a positive way. Um, and I find, I guess I find that's one of the hardest things to communicate to people that, that what you want to see from your dog is excitement. And, and I think this is a, a excitement versus control thing. Mostly people come in with a mentality because I think this is what we learn is that your dog should always be under control. And I do not agree with that. Now you can't have a dog. I'm, I'm not a behave tra uh, a trained behaviorist. So, you know, if you have aggression issues with a dog or something like that, that's a whole separate issue. But if you have a dog that gets the whizzies on course because they're having fun or they're blowing off steam, that's great. Let them do it. What, what harm is being done there? Harness that energy. Just pick them up where you can, send them into a tunnel and be off. Um, and and so I, I think that this is, um, it's, it's very difficult to get people to abandon sort of a control mentality and, and, and move towards a more fun one. Um, I, I don't know if you know what, if, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah, it does. It does make total sense. And that's part of the bonding process. It's fun. Right. It's rewarding. And we're right. doing it together. Yeah. And, and I don't care if you went into the tunnel and then turned around and went back in. Okay. So what? We'll just move forward from there. Um, right. and, and I don't want to, um, I make sure they don't, uh, um, uh, maybe, I mean, not yell or correct, but I don't want to have any type of, uh, maybe punishment associated with, with any of that. I love it when my dog right. breaks loose a little bit because he's a pug and he, he thinks right. that's fun. Um, right. and, and I don't want to, I don't want to squash that, um, exactly. in his excitement. Right. And so sometimes exactly. he goes into the tunnel and then he comes to the end and he's like, I'm not coming out and they'll go back to the other yeah. end. Okay. He'll come out eventually. Right. He'll come out. He's right. coming out. Um, right. He's having fun. Right? So Nolan, exactly. have you, have you uh, ever done any sort of work or, or teaching with any other species? I have not actually, but I love, I love all the videos that I see of, you know, yes! squirrels doing agility and pigs doing agility and, you know, and chickens, chickens doing agility. Chickens <laughs> doing agility. Well, it sort of shows you the, the concepts of, positive reinforcement are, are seem to be pretty universal across species. Um, you know, because you can't, mostly you can't force an animal to do these things. You can encourage them to do that, to do, you know, to do um, variations on, on agility or any other uh, tricks or games you want to do. And so that's what I get a kick out of when I'm, when I'm watching, or cats. I mean, mm -hmm. when I'm, when I'm watching those videos, uh, what I'm watching is how is the handler reinforcing them? Why, why is this worth it for the, the mini goat that I saw, which was adorable. Um, and, and so you can see the concepts are sort of the same. You know, you make it worth their while by rewarding them with something that they really like. And it's um, not. Oh so yeah, no, I haven't done any of that, but, um, but it's, Fun. Well, I was going to say it's novel activity and it's so enriching. You know, we mm -hmm. think about the physical mm -hmm. exercise, but, you know, the mental stimulation and the problem mm -hmm. solving, you know, when I've seen people, you know, have these, uh, you know, 40 feet obstacle courses mm -hmm. in their backyard from mm -hmm. the squirrel that hangs out in the tree or, <laughs> you know, again, the, the pig that you wouldn't think would have a body type to be able to, to do these things. And you mentioned yeah. the cat. I, I remember I had a client who I was working with their dog doing physical rehab and their son was a, 
uh, ranger, let's say, like a um, work for the U.S. Forest Service or something like that. And he was in Wyoming, Montana, and he would winter over in a very remote area in a cabin. And, you know, it was like supplies were dropped to him once a month kind of thing, right? Mm. And he had a cat. And so they got bored. To bide their time, he started doing agility with the cat in the cabin and had all of these, you know, fun, great obstacles. And that was my first introduction to, you know, the concept of, of a cat being able to, to do these things um, because I was probably 15 years ago or so. And, um, and then with my cats, I've done a little bit of that over time. Um, nothing, you know, too crazy, but asking them to do, you know, maybe a specific, you know, skill, like go under this thing or through this tube or, or what have you. And, and we've talked about, you know, enrichment for cats and things uh, as well in other shows. I also want to go back to, we did put a show out on obesity and, you know, you're talking about, you know, giving all these, these treats, but yes. I want to point out that they're also working and expending calories at the same mm -hmm. time that they're receiving these calories. Mm -hmm. And if you are treating them, you know, with again, high value, healthy, or maybe not so healthy treats, maybe that evening, they only get a quarter of their dinner. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so again, we've talked about calories in calories out, and you can certainly accommodate uh, for, for the treats that way. You know, Chris, if we if we think about it, you know, um, we were posting not that long ago about how you and I were treating um, our friend Penelope the pig. Mm -hmm. And honestly, a large portion of her uh, therapy was these obstacle courses, um, mm -hmm. stepping up and stepping over and going around and, um, you know, and, and her motivation was food. It was completely food. And she was pretty proud of herself, but we incorporated a lot of agility stuff into yes. her plan. Um, mm -hmm. And as long as we had food, she was a hundred percent, she had a hundred percent buy-in. And as long surprising, as we had, yeah. surprisingly agile. Right. She really yeah. was. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we had her up on, you know, uh, a ball, well, I was gonna say inflatable, you know, pieces of equipment. She was stepping over things, going under things. And this is all in her, you know, barn um, home environment. But uh, I think Nolan mentioned briefly about, you know, having equipment in your backyard, but you don't have to even have fancy stuff right. to do some of these things. Right. So, you know, people will get like uh, the snow stakes, um, you know, or garden stakes and put them at the appropriate distance in their backyard and, you know, have their dogs, you know, weave in and out of those stakes and, you know, it can be simple stuff. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, um, that's one of the things I think that can be kind of intimidating, um, but you can do a huge amount with, um, with, with jumps that you've made, like you say, that are, that are homemade, that are a couple of boxes and a broom across them or something like that. Mm -hmm. There's there. <clears throat> you know, you can, you can get as fancy as you want. Um, but a huge amount, you can do a huge amount of, of, um, agility right in your backyard with, with homemade stuff. And there, you know, if you get more into it and you want to make your own agility equipment, there are a million things out there on how to make equipment with PVC. So you can, you know, get the dimensions and go over to Home Depot and, um, <clears throat> and, and, buy what you need to make a couple of jumps or something like that it's not most of us don't have things like uh seesaws and and uh a frames a and yeah. <laughs> right and dog walks in our backyard right can we um can we circle back a little bit to some of the benefits because we talked uh, a lot about um the relationship building and the bonding and the enrichment but are there other benefits to agility that we haven't covered i i think Actually, that is the primary one. Mm -hmm. I would say that when for for people um, for people who are bringing their pets, um, I think you also learn. And and I'm not sure if this is exactly what you're getting at, but I think mm -hmm. that you can learn a lot about basic behavior with agility as sort of the the avenue into that or right. the entree into that. Um, and I think that's another really important, um, for me anyway, another really important thing to try to help people understand dog behavior um, and, and how to address it. For example, people will come and they'll say, my dog's blowing me off. My dog can do this at home. My dog's blowing me off. And, and I 
I don't think that dogs typically blow people off. Maybe, maybe occasionally, but, um, but mostly I think what people don't understand is the behavior they're seeing may be stress, um, distraction, that just because your dog does something at home doesn't mean that, um, that they are able to do it. Dogs don't generalize well. They may not be able to do it in a new environment. And so you have to make it easier for them. And that's true no matter what you're doing. And maybe, um, whether you're going, go maybe ahead. you don't pick up necessarily on things like um, if a dog's out on the course and they stop and they are, they're scratching and you're like, yeah. and so what it looks like to you is obviously the dog has an itch, but maybe right. he doesn't. Maybe there's some type right. of uh, it's something that's causing him stress. And he's like, I'm right. going to stop and calm myself by scratching right. or right. something like that. Right. So you're able to pick up on the subtleties of some right. of this behavior, or your trainer is able to point out some of the subtleties yes. of this behavior that may look yeah. like your dog has got an itch, but maybe he doesn't. Right. right. Yeah. And you know, yes, absolutely. You know, itching, sniffing, yawning, stretching, all of these things that people, um, dog won't look at you. Yeah, you know, me. I think that that these are things that people sort of people make an assumption that the dog is is behaving in a human way. Like if a human being did that, you know, they'd be blowing me off. Well, they dogs are not human beings and they don't communicate in the way that human beings do. And so, again, you sort of have to have an understanding about what is the stress and how can you alleviate it? I mean, that's the thing that I think is really important is once you recognize the stress, okay, how do you dial back? How do you, how do you help this dog be comfortable? Right. Um, and that's useful no matter, no matter what. So there are, there are behavioral things that, that I think are um, relevant no matter where you are. The other thing I try to, to, um, to impress upon people is your dog is always observing and learning from you. Just because you quote unquote end a training session doesn't mean that your dog has stopped observing you and sort of learning from you. And so if in fact you really don't want to interact with your dog, and this is more true probably for younger dogs and older dogs that have set routines and, you know, you have a rhythm with them. But for example, with our puppy, if at this point, if we don't want to be pretty directly interacting with her or have our eyes on her, we pop her in her crate with something to chew on. We call it giving her an exoskeleton, basically, mm -hmm. um, because, <laughs> because they are learning from you and picking up cues from you all the time, whether you're aware of it or not. Um, and so to bring some awareness to that, I think, can be very helpful as well. So, Nolan, in that example, are you saying that you don't want Poppet to pick up things that you aren't even aware that you're teaching her and so that's why you put oh, her in the crate yes that or or that that i'm ignoring um you know because ignoring is a form of interacting mm. if i'm if she's in a room doing something that i would not want her to be doing and i'm not there actively engaged with her i need to put her somewhere where she can't do that Gotcha. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Because, because, um, and you know, the older dogs, like I say, much less true. They, they have, we, we have an understanding already with the older dogs about what's okay and what's not okay. And, you know, I can be in the other room quite comfortably and know that they're not going to be, you know, taking things off of the, um, off of the table, for example, but, but a puppy's different that way. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that bad habits develop. And this is true in agility too. I mean, this is not, this is in pretty much any activity that, that you need to be aware of what you are allowing and encouraging your dog to do, even if you're not actively doing that. Right. That, that allowing the behavior, ignoring the behavior can be teaching them something exactly. adverse. Right. Yeah. That it's acceptable somehow. Right, right, right. Good point. Um, so, you know, Kathy had asked about uh, certain um, benefits and, and, you know, what we often preach is, is listening, right? We call it listening to your pet. And so that's what you were kind of describing there. But um, for like my Baxter, he is such a, what we call soft dog. So, mm -hmm. you know, you look at him cross-eyed and he cringes. 
so he started agility at a very young age and that really enhanced his his confidence that's when i see his confidence shine mm-hmm. and over mm-hmm. the course of the pandemic we haven't been engaging in agility and and so forth as much as as we used to and i've seen regression in his mm-hmm. confidence due to that mm-hmm. And so this was kind of an aha moment for me a couple of weeks ago. I'm like, I got to get back to that. You know, he's, yeah. he's kind of losing some, some ground here. So mm-hmm. I think the building confidence, you know, is, is huge. You know, as I mentioned, you did with Nina and in, in your, uh, mm-hmm. in the introduction and so forth. So if a, if a mm-hmm. pet uh, needs that, that's certainly a, mm-hmm. a good agility is a good activity to think about. And sure. then, a friend of mine says the reason that she keeps doing agility is it keeps her own mind so sharp. So Mm -hmm. again, mental acuity, not only for your dog, I mean, they're thinking, 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 and that's why, you know, it's so exhausting, but for us as well, you know, Mm -hmm. we have to have a certain amount of of balance and agility and know where we are in the course and, Mm -hmm. and, you know, and and directives. And there's a lot of multitasking that's going on when, when Mm -hmm. you're out there with your dog on a course. And Mm -hmm. so in terms of, you know, maintaining, you know, the, the sharpness, you know, for ourselves as we're aging or kind of, you know, those memory cells aren't as, as, uh, (laughs) (laughs) as prevalent as they used to be. Oh yeah. It's especially difficult initially until things become body memory and that, and, and sort of the process, I think of things becoming body memory is very good for us too, because you go through a whole, um, you know, there's a, there's a whole process um, by which initially you think I could never do that. There's just no way I can do that. And then, well, okay, I can, I can sort of do it, but I'm still in my dog's way. And then, oh, look, we did it. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> and, and I think that, that that's, you know, as, as, as an instructor, you sort of have to remind people that this is not easy, that, mm-hmm. that, that the process of, of sort of becoming fluent um, in, in these moves and understanding, even plotting out how you're going to handle a particular course. It takes, there's, there's a lot going on there too. Okay. What's the best path for the dog? What's the best path for me? Can I, can I get to where I need to be if I choose this particular, um, this particular maneuver? Um, so there's, and, and again, it comes back to teamwork, but it also, does I think really challenge people to if you're doing courses to memorize the courses and to figure out the best way through them for your team so yeah really um and and if you're you know the the best way through a course for you who may be a little faster in relation to your dog than someone who has a really speedy little papillon um you have to take those things into account the best way for the person with the papillon to handle is not going to be um, the best way for somebody else to handle. So it's very, it's not like you can cheat, you know, you can't get the answer <laughs> from someone else. Yeah. You know, I think that we talked a lot about the body and I think this is a great segue to, to mention that Chris and I, you know, recently did a, a podcast on warming up and cooling down your dog. And I'm not going to go off topic about, um, about warm ups and cool downs, but I think it, it's important to, to think about the body and how, our dogs are using their body um, and, and warm them up and cool them down for injury prevention. And so if you haven't listened to that podcast, you probably should go back and listen to warm up and cool down because um, it's important for, for injury prevention. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Very. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I want to uh, just again, emphasize, you know, earlier, uh, you know, cause we are still kind of slipping back into things that are maybe more related to competition and so forth, but the agility can be highly customized, you know, for your goals, your and your dog's physical fitness levels. Um, I know dogs that have aged out of uh, standard agility, for example, the, the jump heights, they can still compete and they love it because that's what they've been doing their whole lives. But the jump heights are reduced to accommodate those senior dogs. I think it has a special name, doesn't it, Nolan? The- um, it, it's called something different in various different venues it can be performance it can be preferred it can be select but it's exactly what you are saying that that sort of um typically an older dog maybe jumps a slightly not slightly jumps jumps a lesser jump height 
Yep. Um, yep. And, and so they can keep doing, and, right. and they'll, they also take, they maybe do a lower A-frame. They take the spread jumps out so that there's less stress on their body. So mm-hmm. yeah, absolutely. People can, um, people can, their dogs can still, still compete, still run but, the courses. Um, as we're closing up, Nolan, um, mm-hmm. do you have uh, one last thing, one pearl of wisdom, something you'd like to share with our audience about agility? Or a success story or a a transformation maybe that you've, you've witnessed. I, I have seen a number of dogs really teams, not just dogs, but teams really blossom over time as the relationship changes, because as you said, the relationship does change as you learn how to engage your dog in ways that are really fun for them it becomes a whole different relationship and, and you can see it through the game itself, through the game of agility. And some of what I would, I would encourage people to do, as you said, Chris, try it. And remember, it's a game. It's, it's absolutely for having fun. Mm -hmm. Um, And if people choose to compete, that's wonderful, but there's no reason to do there. That is not necessarily the goal of doing agility. Mm -hmm. The goal of doing agility is to have fun with your dog. So Nolan, as we're um, wrapping up, could you let our audience know where they could find you? Um, People can feel free if they have any questions um, to reach me at my email, which is probably not surprisingly, I-L-U-V-K, the number nine, S, I love canines, at gmail.com. And I will be happy to, to answer what I can um, and and refer you to other folks if I if there are things I can't answer. That's such a cute handle. Yeah. I love <laughs> canines at yeah. Gmail. Hey, um, is there, I know you mentioned, I think USDAA in the past, are there um, websites that people can go to to learn more about agility and, and maybe where to find an instructor in their area or a club in their area? Absolutely. There, the if you look for agility classes near me, that will bring up mm. agility in your area and, and probably facilities where, um, where it's taught. Um, you can look up USDAA agility. You can look up there. I'll give you several different of the, of the organizations, okay. but you could also um, agility. You could, could also search for agility organizations and, and you'll find some of this information. Um, there's an organization called UKI agility. Um, there's one called CPE agility. There's one called NADAC, N-A-D-A-C agility. Um, I'm sure I'm leaving some out. But but there, from from if you if you look up information on each of the organizations, you can get I think kind of a feel for where their emphasis lies, um, and and some people will be more comfortable with some than others. And I would certainly encourage people if you can to go to a trial if you're interested in competing. Again, I, I think we did we did sort of end up talking a lot about competition. Um, It's certainly not a requirement, but if you're interested, find where there are trials in your area and go and talk to people because, um, because they can give you sort of the best sense of what, of what that organization will feel like for you. Well, thank you, Nolan. It was, I learned so much today. Great. And I'm kind of, I'm, I'm re excited about the, the sport of agility. Yes, <laughs> get, Mac, get Mac out on an agility I'm, course. I'm really Kathy. ignited, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. I'm glad to hear that. Thanks, my friend. We'll see you soon. You Thank you. you Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed our show. Follow us on Facebook or on Instagram at Petability Podcast. For more information about Kathy's books and living with blind dogs, please go to enableyourpet.com. Thank you and please tune in next time.